Uh, my name is Adnan Abdul Hussain, and I'm with Bitnami. I'm Michelle Norelli, and I'm with Deus. And I'm Matt Butcher. I'm also with Deus. And together, we're about half of the core contributors group from Helm. Um, most of the other half is also sitting in the audience. Uh, and so we wanted to talk to you for a little while today about what Helm is, uh, how you can use it, the problems it solves, and ultimately why it's a good tool for teams to use when we're working collectively on Kubernetes. So speaking of Kubernetes, um, this is sort of like my mental picture of what Kubernetes is. It's this beautiful workshop, right? And you have uh, all these tools, each tool designed to build beautiful things, right? And you can build all kinds of different furniture once you have these tools. You know, you can sculpt these in intricate little details. You can make a basic table. I feel like Kubernetes is kind of like that. We have all these different resource types. And with these different resource types, we can build all kinds of things. Some of them are very basic applications that just get a single job done. Some of them are highly sophisticated, you know, multi-tier aggregates of, you know, with databases and caching layers and vertical uh, uh, auto scalers and things like that. But we've got those tools that can build stuff. Okay, so furniture making. How many of you, by show of hands, make your own furniture? Yep, we've always got a couple in the audience. <laughs> oh, yeah. The thing is, uh, most of us don't want to build our own furniture. We, it's not that we don't value craftsmanship, right? It's not that we don't value beauty or value utility. It's that we don't want to build our own furniture. We want to leave it in the hands of the experts. And so most of us choose this route, right? We want to get furniture that somebody else designed, that somebody else figured out how it can fit into my living environment, and we want to just go with it, right? So there are furniture builders, and there are people like us who are really more furniture assemblers, right? And so when we, as the Helm team, looked at Kubernetes, we said there are all these tools, but to be totally honest, I don't know how to use some of them. And a lot of them I can use, but maybe not to maximal efficiency, right? And so with Helm, we wanted to build the kind of tool that would let the expert furniture builders create us something like IKEA furniture. And that's what Helm is. So let's take Matt's IKEA metaphor to the next level. Say you walk into the wonderland that is IKEA and you shop around for things that you need and sometimes for things that you don't actually need but really, really want. And what you walk out with are these packages of pre-built furniture that gets you that much closer to the living room of your dreams. Uh, so in that same vein, Helm gives you packages of pre-built applications or application components which you can then easily install and manage in your Kubernetes cluster. And that is really powerful. Because if you want WordPress running on Kubernetes, you don't have to build that yourself. If you're trying to get up and, up and running with MySQL, you don't have to start from scratch. You don't even have to figure out how to run Jenkins and Kubernetes yourself. Someone has already solved that problem for you. They built a chart for it. They're willing to share it. They've even embedded their own knowledge of Kubernetes best practices into that chart itself. And that gives us more time for two things. Uh, one, there is uh, more time to get production ready with less effort. And two, there's more time to go to all those hipster coffee shops that we know and love. So I mentioned charts. And uh, packages in Helm world are called charts. So chart is a way to define an application. Uh, it consists of mainly three things. The first is metadata. This is who authored the chart, information like what version it's at, a little description, where your Docker images live. Um, the second piece, the biggest component, are the actual Kubernetes resource definitions themselves. These can be templated or not. Uh, and then there's also documentation. So here's a chart. This is what it means. This is how you run it. Uh, these are some instructions provided by the Kubernetes, uh, excuse me, the chart author. Um, and charts live in these things called chart repositories. And Adnan will give us a deep dive into that a little bit later, but this is what it is at a high level. So you can grab Helm from GitHub, 
from our release page uh, or you can use Homebrew to install Helm. And once you've got it, um, getting started is really simple. You get started by using the uh, Helm init command. And init does two things. The first thing is that it configures your local environment. And the second thing is that it installs Tiller, which is the um, in-cluster component uh, that Helm uses to manage chart installations. So Tiller lives his life, his humble life, inside of Kubernetes as a pod. And every time you install a chart, it creates this thing called a release. And a release holds uh, all the information uh, that comes with installing your chart. So all of the metadata and the resources that were actually created inside of Kubernetes. So let's see this actually happen. And where's my mouse? I think I messed things up for you. That's okay. <laughs> so, computers are hard. <laughs> How do I escape it? No, that doesn't work either. This is what happens on the after lunch session. You want to switch out of the mirror mode? Yeah. Cool. Magic. That works. <laughs> All right. So, how many? It? It's as simple as that. Uh, and then you'll see the actual tiller pod um, living in the uh, cube system namespace. So it's at the bottom. And that's as simple as, uh, as it is for getting started. All right, so once you've got Tiller up and running, you'll want to actually install charts. So let's see what that workflow looks like. So say you want to search for WordPress. You get one result. This is, uh, you've gotten a WordPress chart back in the stable repository. Charts are always namespaced by the repository that they live in. And you can also search for what other charts are in the repository that you have access to. So we'll install the WordPress chart here using the install command. And a few things happen, so let's dissect that. Uh, first, we fetch the WordPress chart from the stable repository. And Tiller created a release for you with a randomly generated name. This one is Wobbling Mule. If you want to have less fun in life, then you can also pass in the dash N flag. Uh, but I, I recommend this way. And you also get some metadata back, information on the actual Kubernetes resources that were created. And at the very bottom, um, you get uh, some notes or post installation instructions that the chart author has provided for you. So here we see that we can get the WordPress URL by running this command. Um, and then we also have some information on the default um, credentials that you can use uh, in your blog. So we'll just run that command, set the service IP. This is where you're actually going to go to see your WordPress chart live. And there's your WordPress blog, voila. And you can even log in with your uh, credentials here. And so uh, there are, once, you've had a, once you have a release, you can use the helm list command to see what releases are active. And you can also run the helm get command to get more information about your release. These are all the manifest files and the metadata and the values and configuration. Uh, you can also run the helm status command, which, which will give you the latest information on the resources uh, associated with your release running in the cluster. Um, and it'll also give you the notes.txt uh, file, which is the post installation instructions. So once you've got 
a, uh, once you've got an application and you know, you're happy, it's running, it works, you write your blogs, you say hello KubeCon, you write about KubeCon frequently, Um, so we'll see that we have some data here. And if we go back to our admin page, we'll see we're running WordPress on 4.5.3, which is not the latest version. We can update to 4.6.1. Uh, so the, the command that you can use to upgrade your application is upgrade. And uh, all you need to do is say Helm upgrade, pass in a release name, and what chart uh, you want to upgrade to. So here we're updating to the uh, latest version of stable WordPress. And again, you get some metadata, all of the Helm status uh, output. And if we go back to, oh, and we'll also see um, what, what is happening behind the scenes. So you're seeing uh, we're recreating the container, the WordPress container, as we have an upgraded version. And if we just watch that, we'll see the container getting created. We'll see it's now running, and now it's ready, which means we can go back to our WordPress site and make sure that everything didn't blow up. I have a feeling it didn't, <laughs> but you never know with these recorded demos. <laughs> so we're at 4.6.1, and we still have all of our data. Yes. <laughs> So, so we installed charts, we upgraded our release. Um, every time an upgrade works, that's how I feel, still, and I help build that. <laughs> so, and uh, you can also delete all of the components of your release um, with the Helm delete command. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so Michelle walked you through how you can um, manage the releases of your chart uh, and um, upgrade and delete them. Um, but you're probably wondering, how do you package your own application as a chart? Uh, well, Helm has a really easy command to get you started. Um, all you need to run is Helm create my app. And this is what you'll get. Um, some YAML files, a uh, couple of directories. Not to be punny, but you're probably wondering, how do I navigate this thing? So the first place you want to look is in the templates directory. Uh, so if you're already um, deploying your application to Kubernetes, you probably already have some deployment files or services or um, any Kubernetes resource. Um, so if, if you dumped all those files in this directory, you'd al you would already be uh, ready to go. Um, but as an added bonus, Tilla will also run through each of these files um, and run them through the template rendering engine. Um, so that allows you to do more complex stuff like in this example. Uh, so here I have a deployment and you can see that I'm interpolating some values. Um, and these values are being defined in what's called the values.yaml file. Uh, so see this file as the API for your chart. In this example, I'm setting the port for my service and I'm substituting it in here in the deployment. Um, but I can also substitute that same value in my service file. Um, and so if I wanted to go and change that port, I'd only need to change it in one place, in the values.yaml file. And going back to the idea that it's, an, it's the API for your chart, uh, when people uh, want to go and install that chart, you can actually uh, override the default port uh, in the command line, as shown here. Um, and also for more complex configuration, you may just want to pass in your own values.yaml file to override the values. So as you're building out your chart, uh, you may realize that you need to bring in some dependencies. So for example, for WordPress, you may find that you need to bring in a, a, a database chart. Uh, so this is where the charts directory comes in. Um, and inside the charts directory, you can essentially vendor in uh, a normal chart, um, it, it would have the same structure as the outer chart. Uh, and when you go and do Helm install, um, Helm will also deploy that chart with the outer chart. 
if you find yourself using uh, a dependent chart in multiple places, then you can make use of Helm's requirements.yaml file, uh, which similar to a gem file or requirements.txt in Python, allows you to specify the name of the chart, the version you want, and the repository uh, it, uh, it can be found in. Uh, and then, then you can run Helm dependencies update, and it'll pull in that chart. Documentation. Um, so there are two ways to document your chart. There's the README, which is generally the first place that people will look. Um, so this is, you know, if, you're, if your chart is on GitHub somewhere um, and people are browsing your GitHub repository, they'll be able to see your README. Um, so this is where you'd want to document what the chart actually is. Um, and maybe even talk about some prerequisites. So you may need a specific version of Kubernetes, for example. Um, and other practices we've seen are people uh, documenting uh, every single configuration option in the values.yaml file and uh, the defaults for all of those values. Uh, then you may have seen in the demo, um, there was some text that got printed out for WordPress that allowed you to run a command and get the IP address uh, and also see the credentials. That's the notes.txt file being printed out. So, this file will be printed out after doing a Helm install um, or a Helm upgrade, um, and even when um, running Helm status on the release. If you're familiar with something like Homebrew, it's similar to uh, caveats being printed out after installing a package in Homebrew. Um, so this is a great place for putting any post-installation information that may be relevant for your chart. Um, like in the WordPress one, you can uh, use it to get the IP address. Um, other things we've seen is uh, querying the secrets API to get the um, get passwords uh, and things like that. Uh, as Michelle mentioned on the previous slide, um, the other part of your chart is the metadata. And this pretty much all exists in the chart.yaml file. Uh, so you have a description of the chart, uh, keywords, um, the sources for the Docker images, and who's maintaining that chart. Um, but you also have a version field. And this doesn't necessarily have to be the same version of the thing that you're packaging. Um, and the reason for that is you may want to change the API of your chart um, independently of the underlying MariaDB version. Uh, and so you can use that field to uh, express that. So once you've done building your chart, um, you might want to think about opening your own IKEA store. Um, charts usually live in what's called a chart repository. And um, to put it simply, these are essentially just, is, this is just uh, an HTTP server which has an index.yaml file and the package versions of your charts. Um, and once you go and add that repository using the Helm repo add command, um, Helm will go and download the index.yaml file, uh, cache that locally, and then once you go and install a specific chart, and we'll figure out the latest version um, and go and install that. I wanted to mention here um, some work in progress work that we've been, uh, we've been doing. Uh, and this is a, essentially a place that, to discover and um, search available charts in repositories. Um, so the source is at github.com, hell monocular. Um, but it essentially indexes repositories and allows you and provides a visual interface over that. So in, ad in addition to hosting your own chart repository, um, uh, a couple of awesome folks from the Helm community have been maintaining um, the official charts repository for Kubernetes. Um, and this is currently split out into two repositories. There's the incubator repository, which is a great place for um, sharing and developing ideas for charts and also trying out new Kubernetes alpha features. Um, and then there's a stable repository uh, which contains a set of curated and ready to run applications. Uh, and right now these applications range from databases to applications. Uh, we even have a few games in there um, and uh, things like Apache Spark and more integrated Jenkins setups. Uh, so if you're looking at this and thinking um, there's one or two things that uh, you think you could add to this repository, then my work here is done. Um, 
you know, it's an open repository, and we're really looking for um, high-quality contributions. So um, create charts and send us PRs. Uh, so whilst maintaining this chart repository, um, a couple of us have been thinking about what best practices we want to form um, for both charts and Kubernetes resources themselves. Um, and although these are you know, constantly evolving as Kubernetes and Helm themselves evolve, I wanted to share some uh, common patterns that we've seen. So the first one is, is pretty, uh, pretty obvious. Your chart should work out of the box. If you, if you have a, a WordPress chart, um, it should have everything it needs to go and deploy uh, a working version of WordPress. Um, a chart should only be responsible for deploying a single component. If you find yourself building a chart that um, is deploy uh, has manifests for a database as well as the application itself, you might want to split that out into a subchart. Um, because that subchart can also be used, uh, reused, uh, and this goes to my next point, don't repeat yourself, um, can be reused in other charts. Um, for example, the MariaDB chart is reused in um, Drupal, Redmine, WordPress and all, all those charts. Um, Helm also provides other ways to stop repeating yourself. Um, you can use the Go templating engine to create partials uh, to reduce duplication in your manifests themselves. Uh, so a good example is if, you're, if you find yourself repeating labels in multiple manifests, um, you can create a, a Go partial and, and uh, sub that partial in in each of your resource types. Your chart should also be reproducible. Um, when, you, when you package and share the chart, it should, um, the deployment should work uh, as it did on, on your cluster. Um, and there are two general ways that you can do this. Uh, you want to make sure that your template is as declarative as possible uh, and reduce any scripting. And also, um, you should make sure that you're pointing to uh, immutable image tags or uh, content charts. Finally, you want to expose the right API to your users. Um, any application configuration, secrets, uh, things like persistence or re requ uh, resource requests and limits should all be configurable via the values.yaml file. And furthermore, you should also be making sure that you're setting sane defaults uh, and, uh, yeah, sane defaults. So we started off by looking at what Helm was, right? When I came out here, I tried to give a good brief explanation. Then we went from that, from that furniture metaphor, into seeing how Michelle used Helm to install and then manage a couple of charts, right? We looked at the WordPress installation. And then Adnan walked you through the process of creating a chart uh, and, and then showed some of the best practices. And now I want to kind of bring it all back together by explaining why we built this tool the way we did and why it's designed to help teams. And I thought I'd highlight five different ways. So I know that for some of us in here, when, you know, going back to that furniture metaphor, right, we like the idea of being in the role of just picking our furniture and assembling it, not you know, handcrafting it lovingly from scratch. That was an intentional design goal for us. We really, really wanted to make it easy for the teams that are new to Kubernetes to get started quickly. So you can find some actually usable stuff out there in that stable charts repository or uh, experiment with some of the cutting edge stuff in the incubator repository and have something up and working quickly. And then you can go back and look at what it is that you created and get kind of that sort of view of Kubernetes. Yes, I installed it. Yes, I see that it's WordPress. How does it work? Oh, it's got this service. Oh, it's got this deployment and this database. They connect this way. And it's a great way for many of us to kind of learn the internals of Kubernetes. Now, I know that some of you in here are not IKEA shoppers. You're furniture makers, right? And so when we went to build the, the chart format, the chart language, and the template language, we intentionally tried to design something that would allow you the, the ability to dive all the way in to the Kubernetes resource types, to change all the different stuff in there. We, we don't layer on constraints. We don't restrict you to particular resource types. We try and give you all those furniture building tools. 
And then we tried to build a system that made it easy for those of you who are ex domain experts in these fields to share these charts with other people. Now, it might be that you're just sharing them internally with your team, right? The application developers throw their app over the wall, you build them a chart, and then you can reliably and reproducibly deploy this chart. But it might be that you want to contribute back upstream into the stable repo or your organization wants to start its own repo, and we wanted to make that easy for you to do as well. So that's, that's the second one. The third one was where things got tricky for us, right? Um, it's not just, when you look at a package manager, and we've all looked at them, right? You do your uh, brew install or apt-get or yum or whatever. Uh, usually we're only installing one instance of something. But in a cluster, you ought to be able to take the same chart and install it as many times as you want. There, uh, you want two, five, whatever, eight Maria databases, you should be able to install them. But then we ended up in the application lifecycle management. And that's where tools like Helm install and then update, rollback, history, all these extra add-ons here, tools to manage the application lifecycle. That's where these came in. So for example, you go and do an upgrade, something fails, you run a Helm rollback and you can go back to a previous version. That's all lifecycle application management. <clears throat> now, whenever there's a paradigm shift, which is basically, I think, what we're seeing, right? Kubernetes is very different from, uh, from the kinds of architectures I worked on. But we have a bunch of existing tooling. And whenever there's a shift like this, we need to figure out bridges. Right? We need to figure out how Jenkins is going to work in the Kubernetes world when it was a tool that was essentially built for running, on bare, running bare metal stuff you know, 10, 15 years ago. So one of our design goals was to borrow metaphors that people, and, uh, that people are already comfortable with. That package management metaphor is good. That command line metaphor with configuration files, that stuff works well. And we designed Helm to be able to work in existing CI, CD systems and with existing shell scripting tools and like that and tried to expose things so that it made sense that way. Because it's not merely the case that we as humans are comfortable with repeating design patterns like a package manager, right? The thing is we built tools that expect package managers to behave a particular way. And we've tried to carry those assumptions into Helm so that Helm really feels to your tool chain like a package management system. Now, finally, the fifth point is that the Kubernetes cluster should be, and we feel very strongly about this, the collaborative center for your team, for your releases. Okay, so if we're all working together on an app and I go and deploy something at 4.50 on a Friday and then take off and at 5.05 it crashes, you should be able to go look in that, I've never done that, I swear. You should be able to go look in the cluster and see what I did. And you can grab that release out of there and say, oh, Matt changed this value in the values.yaml file and it got put here and there was an unintended consequence. We're gonna roll it back, we're gonna fix that perimeter, we're gonna redeploy it the right way and then on Monday we're gonna chew Matt out at the standup. That's the way we built this tool. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> except for the chewing out part, you have to do that on your own. Uh, but no, the idea is that the, the cluster itself, uh, Kubernetes is a great way to gain visibility cluster-wide into all the different things that are running. And we wanted to take that design philosophy and make sure that it carried all the way over into this package management system. So those are five ways that Helm helps you, uh, helps your team manage releases and applications inside of a Kubernetes con uh, context. All right, now I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the community that has done this. We have uh, over 65 contributors have done at least one PR. Lots of contrib contributors have done dozens of PRs. We introduced Helm at 0 .01 at last KubeCon. We're about to release version 2.0. So we're one year old and we have experienced tremendous growth and we're really excited because the 2.0 release really uh, is the concrete implementation of what we had envisioned when we set out for this. We're really, really pleased and excited about it. We would love to get a chance to talk to you guys, to see you guys uh, you know, talk to each other about this. We have the Kubernetes uh, Slack channel Helm uh, there are about, what, 500 and some people who just hang out in there. Uh, it's a great place to ask questions when you're get, getting going. It's a great place because all of the developers hang out in there. It's a great place to say, hey, did you think of this use case? Or how would you do this use case? Or can I make a feature request? In which case we'll say, head over to GitHub, file an issue here. Uh, but we really want to be interactive with the community, and the community itself has been amazing for us. Now, one of the things that we do is we hold a public developer stand-up on Thursdays. And the idea is 
all of the core developers that can make it will sign in on a Thursday morning and will give their regular stand up. This is what I've been working on in the last week. This is what I plan to work on. Uh, this is what, what I'm struggling with. And the community, anybody who feels like it can show up to these meetings. And there's time to ask questions. Uh, we've even have had people show up in the community and say, hey, I did something really cool. You mind if I show? We've had that happen a few times. And we'll often just do sort of spur of the moment demos. If you just want to come and watch and be quiet, that's fine too. But it's a great opportunity to sort of see under the hood. As you probably know, um, most Kubernetes projects are under at least one special interest group, one SIG. And our parent SIG is the SIG app SIG. Uh, and that meets on Monday mornings. That is another awesome place to go to just kind of, it's, it's very demo driven. Michelle and Matt Farina run the meeting. Uh, so it's very demo driven, very, uh, it's, one week you may see an alpha feature that's on its way into Kubernetes. The next week you may see, uh, you know, somebody's project where they used Kubernetes in an interesting and novel way. Uh, most of the projects in SIG apps, including Helm, we give our weekly update on our status. And then there's a great time near the end where you can just drop in, ask some questions, toss out some ideas, get yourself scheduled to give a demo and stuff like that. So we've worked really hard to try and, uh, you know, give back to the community that's been awesome to us give back a voice so that we can keep moving collectively because this tool is only going to be a successful tool if it's meeting the needs, a very broad swath of needs for all of us that are in here. Okay, so um, what's next? So we are really, really close to the 2.0 release. We released uh, RC2 on probably Friday at 4.50, knowing my previous. <laughs> um, and then I came here so nobody could chew me out if I broke the build. Uh, <laughs> so we will be out probably within the next seven days. I don't think there are any showstopper bugs in there right now. And so the 2.0 release will come out. That's uh, already we're at API stability, API frozenness. Um, then we're going to transition after the 2.0 release. We'll keep 2.0.1.2 uh, patch releases. But the 2.1 branch will begin our next round of feature development. So we've been talking a lot about stability stories. How do we help people increase the stability of, of their, uh, their Helm-based uh, ecosystem, right? Uh, how do we make things more and more secure? Uh, and we've already put down some foundations. We're just trying to figure out how to solidify those. And there are a lot of feature requests in there that we will do. Uh, we are working hard at a feature we're really excited about that would allow um, chart developers to declare tests for their charts. And then when you push in your chart on an install, you can pass in a test flag, and it'll be able to run some tests to verify it. So you can do in-cluster testing. Uh, Michelle and Adnan are both working hard, and Adam are all working hard on figuring out the nuts and bolts of that. But we're really excited to be able to introduce sort of a, a paradigm way to do this that won't require you to stand up an additional system outside of Helm just to test and see if your Helm charts are in fact doing what you want. <coughs> you already saw the, uh, the monocular UI. That team is working hard on bringing a unified UI where you can uh, you know, point your browser to it and search charts uh, across multiple repositories. And then really, the, the real high point to me is we are experiencing massive growth in that Kubernetes charts repository. We're not anywhere near, you know, we'd love to be more like Debian and Red Hat where you can go there and search and find hundreds and hundreds of packages that you want to have the opportunity to install, right? Where we've got 30 that are already designated stable. I don't know, how many do we have in incubator? 15, 20? And then we have a couple dozen that are still in the PR process that'll make their way in. But I know some of you in here saw something up there and went, you know what? I could do this and I could contribute it. We would love to see you guys jump in there and help us out because we are not domain experts in everything. Um, in fact, I think we would like to set up a, <coughs> um, a sprint on these maybe tomorrow. Yeah, so Adnan and Vic. Vic, you want to raise your hand? These two guys are the, the owners of the Kubernetes Charts repository. And they, are, uh, they, they would be more than happy to get you started um, and point you in the right direction for any of the documentation and stuff like that. We'll try and figure out something tomorrow and organize it over the Slack channel and let you guys know what our plans are for that. Uh, finally, uh, I do want to call out the rest of the uh, core contributors. And I actually wrote them down because I'm scared to death I'm going to forget somebody. But Brian's back there. Uh, Jack is up here. Adam is up here. Miguel. My, it was way back there in the back, yeah. Um, uh, Vic is right up there, and Ville, uh, I think, is in another session right now. And Sebastian is right there. There's Sebastian. 
And, and Lockie, I know, is also in another session right now. Uh, but these guys together, th these people have really formed sort of the core of the contributions to this, uh, it, some of them by doing massive amounts of coding, some by shepherding through charts and LGTMing other people's work. I just wanted to give them uh, a public acknowledgement. Thank everybody so much for it. Thank you guys for coming today. I hope I see you guys all in the Slack channel. How are we on time? Do we have time for QA or? Okay, I'm gonna be the talk show host since we only have two mics and since Michelle has the other one, she'll answer all your questions. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Um, question about Tiller. Can you talk a little bit more about what exactly it does and uh, what, what functionality it, it enables in, uh, in Helm and if there, if there is a way to or if it makes sense to run a version of Helm that doesn't have that component and just has the CLI? Those are really good questions. So let's break that up. What is Tiller? Tiller is uh, just a pod. Um, so when you uh, when you send you send Tiller basically a chart uh, to install, and then uh, Tiller contains the templating engine, which Matt built. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> rendering template rendering. So if your if your charts are templated, uh, it'll evaluate all that. It'll generate the resource manifest. Then it'll create uh, a config map um, to store all of your uh, all of your chart metadata and the actual resource templates that were generated. And so uh, it's like the source of truth um, for for your charts and for your cluster and. Uh, as far as the client side only version went, we built that first. So the Helm Classic project, which you can still find out there, we initially, our first version was inspired mainly by Homebrew. So in the Homebrew model, you know, you pull all the data down locally um, and then you run your install. That. So the original version of Helm was a client only one. We switched to the server one primarily to allow teams to sort of collaborate because the client side one, then the client became the uh, the absolute source for all the data and uh, you know the the me breaking things on Friday then nobody can address the problem until I come back on Monday so we Helm two really our, our shift was to build the tiller part that sat in the cluster so that teams could collaborate better many people do like the original model and so Helm Classic is still out there and will always be out there uh, and is in maintenance but yeah uh, you had a question then I'll bring it back to you uh, how does the Helm CLI handle uh, cluster context changes. Uh, do you want do you want to answer? Or do you want me to? You got it. Okay, so so the question was about the 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 way you change cluster context. So I assume by that you mean you've got one Kubernetes cluster running here, another over there. So basically, uh, we use the kubectl configuration files as our first uh, as our preferred source of reference information though if you're running in cluster it'll drop down to the environment variables so whatever you're pointing to in your kube config file is what helm will pick up but there are then parameters where you can override it and say uh, you know i know kubectl is pointed at cluster a but dash dash use context cluster b uh, on your command and it'll point it to the other cluster um, does that answer your question I was afraid you were also gonna then follow up with like, and Ubernetes, and I'd be like, ah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna bring it back to you, and then I'll come over here. Yeah, sorry if you guys are mentioned this already, but is there like a scripting capability at all? Like if you need to do something a little more complicated with uh, you know, the sort of parameters, the configuration of your chart? Something like if, if some user feedback needs to be solicited, or user input needs to be solicited, so any kind of scripting, basically, within a chart. You're gonna make me answer that, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you so the question is about uh, what kind of, really, uh, how, how scriptable is this thing would be a good way of capturing it, right? So the Helm template language supports a pretty broad number of control structures and things like that. Um, but of course, that rendering is all going to happen. Uh, you push the chart from the client up to Tiller. Tiller will render everything and then push it into the cluster. So now what about those cases where you push something into the cluster and the pod stands up and that's when it needs to find out some information, right? So the way we've been approaching that is to rely on some of the things Kubernetes has already given us, uh, init containers and some of that. Uh, 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 we also have a hook system that we actually did add where you can say I wanna run these jobs or these pods beforehand and generate some data and put them in a config map, for example. So there are a few layers like that. 
And our, our gut feel is that if we let it sit like this for a while, one of two things will happen. Either people will find that they're satisfied with those solutions and we'll, and we'll get some great patterns and next year when we do the best practices section, it'll be in there. Or we'll discover that people are actually trying to do things more complicated than the tooling will provide, in which case we will have to solve that problem. And uh, you know, in, in dark corners of, of, of black rooms, we've discussed some various things we, we might want to try, but we haven't implemented anything yet. So we'll kind of have to see what usage patterns emerge and then go from there. Who is? Thank you. Where is the state kept in Tiller, and how is it made sure that it will be there when I need it? Great question. So that's, uh, that's con uh, Tiller creates a yeah. config map every time um, uh, you install a chart. And so the config map is the actual state of your release, and it holds all the information. So if your Tiller pod goes away uh, and it spins back up for some reason, it'll still have all the state because it'll reference the config maps um, that it owns in the kube system namespace. Yeah, so essentially it should end up being as resilient as your Kubernetes cluster is. Does anybody else have any questions? I'll go there and How can we use Helm with existing services that are in production? I'm gonna let Matt handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to keep the microphone. I'm going to start answer, asking and answering the questions. So the question is, you know, how do you mesh this with things that are already in production? Uh, there I have only bad news. We have not solved the problem where you can say, hey, here's my environment, extract a chart from it, and then let's track it from here on. I would love to see that tool because I think it would be very powerful um, because you've got most of the core information already. You can extract the manifest and maybe do, use label queries to do it. Uh, but we don't have a good answer for that one right now, which is why you made me answer that question, isn't yep. it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you can reference in a chart another chart, and that's a dependency, right? So A can reference B, and B can reference C, right? Yeah. There's probably a word for that, but never mind. And C can reference A, right? Well, what happens if C reference A? References A. You so see, you see what I'm asking, right? Yeah. So you're asking about recurring dependencies, essentially. Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure if we actually, if the, uh, if Helm actually can figure that out right now. Um, the thing is, the, the the package that you get ends up being vended in completely. So. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut us off because we're right up against the next session. And there are okay. multiple people in the back of the room going. Sa saved so. by the bell. Thank saved you guys the very bell. much. We're not dodging that last question exactly. But yeah, thank you. And to those of you in here who have contributed PRs, thank you very much. And issues and all of that. Thank you.